second speaker today is um, Joanne Sweezy. <clears throat> and um, again, Joanne's someone who started in a different area. She's an enzymologist studying um, DNA polymerases and got interested in the whole question of DNA mutagenesis and repair, its effect on cancer, and even more recently, its effect on autoimmune disease. So it's a, quite a broad spectrum. Um, and she's the Ensign Professor of Therapeutic Radiology in one of our uh, many leadership roles in the Cancer Center, which is why this is sad. <laughs> Because Joanne is leaving, she has just, just recently announced that she is going to the University of Arizona to take on a major leadership position at their cancer center. And Joanne, despite that, is has agreed to talk today. But um, this is a chance for us to thank Joanne for all her service to Yale and uh, best of luck going forward. Thank Thanks. You. All right, it's a pleasure to give a talk uh, to you today. And I'm actually going to go back to my uh, biochemical roots. Uh, I'm going to talk about some mechanistic insights into a mutator phenotype and cancer. And this is just to say that uh, uh, we're funded a little bit by AbbVie, but what I'll be talking about today in the talk has nothing to do with the AbbVie funding. So this is one of my favorite molecules. I have two favorite molecules. One of them is RecA protein. And uh, the second one is DNA polymerase beta. This has more to do with cancer probably than RecA protein. Um, so this is the molecule that we've been studying in the lab for a long time. Uh, DNA polymerase beta has two activities. It has a DRP lyase activity that can remove a DRP group from a five prime end of DNA. And it also has a polymerase activity. And here you'll see the DNA moving through the polymerase with the substrate, in this case, a DCTP. Uh, and uh, you can see this is the lyase domain. This is the thumb domain which binds to DNA, modulates interactions with DNA, the palm subdomain, which is uh, where the, the active site of the enzyme is. And uh, then we have uh, the fingers, which sort of modulate the binding uh, of the DNTP. The nomenclature is based on our uh, dear friend and colleague, Tom Stites. When he first crystallized a clenal fragment, he likened it to a right hand gripping a rod, the rod being DNA. Paul Beta functions in base excision repair. It, this is a very important cellular process, mainly removes a small base damage through either a monofunctional or bifunctional glycosylase pathway. Monofunctional glycosylases remove the base, uh, leaving an abasic site, which is incised. The backbone is then incised by AP endonuclease, leaving a single nucleotide gap with a three prime hydroxyl and a five prime phosphate. And that five prime phosphate is what's removed by Paul Beta. Paul beta fills in the gap, and then down here off the slide is where ligase uh, seals the neck. Bifunctional glycosylases remove both the base and cut the backbone, leaving these uh, awful DNA ends that need to be remodeled. And again, all roads lead to DNA polymerase beta. So uh, what I'm saying here, and this is a lot of people work on this. Surprisingly, a lot of people work on Paul beta. It's actually a competitive field. <laughs> but this is, this is just our work showing that Basically, errors committed uh, by DNA polymerase beta during single nucleotide gap filling can actually lead to mutations. And the reason I'm saying that is because of this. Base excision repair operates on 20,000 to 50,000 lesions per cell per day. So it's a major genome maintenance pathway. It operates in processes bases damaged by reactive oxygen and nitrogen species, uracil and deamination pro uh, products, methylated bases, uh, especially here with chemotherapy. So if you have base excision repair mutations, our lab has actually shown that you can be resistant to alkylating agents. Uh, active demethylation and transcription, somatic hypermutation, and this is other work that we do in the lab. Okay, so uh, a while back, we, we uh, uh, started to work on this particular polymerase mutation, K289M to methionine, so lysine to methionine at the tip of helix N. Helix N is very important for positioning that DCTP or the DNTP in the active site. And this was identified by a group as being present in a colon carcinoma. It's a somatic mutation. Uh, our group, and I'll show you some evidence for this, showed that it induces cellular transformation if we express it in cells, that it's a sequence context specific mutator polymerase. And I'm going to show you evidence for that. And we know that it acts very nicely in base excision repair, completely support base excision repair. It's quite an active DNA polymerase. This is an old uh, slide uh, from an earlier study. And here's where we're just expressing K289M 
in, these are in, in actually in mouse cells that are non-transformed but immortal. We can now do the same but you, in human, but I'm, I'm just showing you the mouse cells. So if, if we don't express it, we don't see foci. These are old-fashioned foci. They're not the foci that we talk about today, the RAD51 foci. These are cells growing on top of each other. And if we express it, we see lots of uh, foci or cellular transformation. And this is what they look like up close. I can tell you that uh, we can do the same with wild type protein, the normal protein where K is at 289. We, we don't see this phenotype at all. And we're not overexpressing this at all. We're expressing it at, this, at similar levels to the endogenous polymerase. We've also shown that it can induce anchorage independent growth. So these are colonies growing in soft agar. Now what's really cool about this polymerase is that it makes mutations. And in vivo, we looked at mutations made by this polymerase in vivo. And in vivo, it mutates this very famous gene, the APC gene, which of course is a cancer gene. It's mutated in a lot of tumors. And it mutates it in the hot spot where we usually find mutations in APC. And uh, you can see that if we just, we can do this in vivo, we can do it in vitro, we can just copy DNA in vitro. But in vivo, we know that, that this polymerase actually has a mutator phenotype, about 16-fold higher mutation frequency for mutations just within that hotspot sequence. So we surmised that, uh, that in this hotspot sequence, if the K289M DNA polymerase put in C opposite template C, as I'll show you evidence for, we would have an increase in mutations in APC, which is going to uh, we're going to lead to phenotypes like cell migration. It'll inhibit apoptosis, activate cell growth, and of course lead to cancer. This is, of course, not our work. This is work from many, many, many labs. So, so this is quite an opportunity. We actually have a handle on a molecule that might be causing these mutations in APC. And so we're very interested in the mechanism of mutagenesis by K289M in the sequence context. So we know that it's specifically this sequence context, lots of other sequences, we don't see mutations. We only see, we predominantly see it in this sequence context. So if we go back to basics, what do we need to have a, to obtain a C to D, G transversion? Well, we need the polymerase to misincorporate DCTP opposite template C. Polymerases really don't like to do this. For some reason, this polymerase, K289M, doesn't mind doing it. So here we're going to bring in G opposite template C. We're looking at the rate of polymerization here, and you can see that the rate of polymerization uh, for this particular polymerase is slow. This, this is just fine. It, it can fill gaps just fine in the cell and in, in vitro. When we bring in C opposite template C, there's not much of a difference between the rate for correct versus incorrect, meaning the, that the fidelity, the ability of this polymerase to make mistakes within the sequence contact is very high. The fidelity is very low. So it's an error-prone polymerase within the sequence context. So we wanted to know why. So we thought, well, it's a polymerase. It has to, there has to be some substrate selection or misselection during covalent bond formation, during the transition state, something called chemistry. And so Charles McKenna, oops, Charles McKenna and Myron Goodman have built these Nucle uh, these, uh, these analogs, where they're decorating the beta gamma phosphate with different moieties, and these actually, these, these actually tend to alter the pKa. So they're changing the pKa. And we have a whole toolkit of these that we can use to just probe tra the transition state. So let's look at, we won't go too deep into biochemistry, but let's look at the transition state. So here we have our single nucleotide gap. And now we're going to fill it, we're going to fill that gap with one of these with one of these analogs. So we've got this chemical transition state, which is a pentavalent transition state with a leaving group. So you can see what happens if we can if we can decorate the beta gamma phosphate here with CF2, we can actually make that leaving group more negative. And if we make that leaving group more negative, it moves chemistry forward. And so what happens is that we get an increase in the rate of, of, of chemistry. We can also make the leaving group horrible so that chemistry is very slow. And so then we can go on to, to fill in the gap. All right, so we're going, to probe, we're going to probe the transition state with these analogs. And by the way, these analogs can also be polymerase inhibitors. So we're going to use these various sequences. This is a control sequence. And it's, it's a sequence we know that K289M does not mutate. It perfectly 
perfectly accurate in the sequence. It happens to be the favorite sequence of X-ray crystallographers for Paul Beta. There are thousands of crystals of Paul Beta in the PDB, and they always use this sequence. APC, here's the APC sequence. And then what we can do is we can take these, you notice they're all, we're all going to be polymerizing. We're all going to be inserting opposite template C. It's always template C, but the bases around that templating base are different. So for APC, here's the APC sequence. Then what we can do is we can take this chunk in the control and stick it into the APC sequence. And we can do the same thing. We can take this APC chunk and stick it, uh, and stick it into the control sequence. So we have four different sequences. All right, this is a little busy. Uh, but this is, we can look at linear free energy relationships. We don't need to worry about that. We can just look at, at the log of polymerization or the rate of polymerization as a function of the leaving group, as a function of the pKa. So you can see for the control sequence with wild type, as we increase the pKa, polymerase rate goes down. And we have a negative slope. Fine. We can do this also with the APC sequence. And we see this negative slope. And we can do it with the APC uh, in control and the control in APC sequence. All of those, we see the same negative slope. But if we look at K289M, it's absolutely remarkable. So we see here with, uh, with the control sequence, and we put that little piece of control in the APC, we see these negative slopes for K289M. But with the APC sequence, whether it's the APC sequence straight, or if we just plop the APC sequence into that control sequence, we almost have a flat line. Suggesting that in this particular sequence context, only for APC, do we have a real problem and that chemistry, transition state chemistry, covalent bond formation, is not really where, where specificity is occurring. It's got to be occurring someplace else. So where is it? Well, so the conclusions here are the rate limiting step of the wild type is sequence context independent, but K289M exhibits sequence context specificity at the transition state. Now we've known for years that polymerases exhibit se sequence context specificity, but now we think we might have a handle on the mechanism. So K289M is limited by chemistry with the control sequence, but we think a pre-catalytic step limits K289M with the APC sequence and that the four nucleotides flanking the templating base are sufficient for the transi transition state specificity. All right. So now, again, we have a right hand gripping a rod, except right now it looks like a left one, but that's OK. So what we're going to do now is we're going to look at forcer resonance energy transfer to look at precatalytic conformational changes. And here we put a donor, which fluoresces. And as the fingers close, what I didn't tell you is when the DNTP binds, the fingers close. So if we have a donor sequence here and a quench on the DNA, as the finger, when the DNTP binds, as the fingers close, we see quench in fluorescence, <clears throat> and then the fingers reopen. And I'll show you what that looks like right here. So we can monitor this as a function of time. The fluorescence, here's the fingers closing at different concentrations of the DNTP. They close, and then they open back up. So we can actually, now these are thousands and thousands of points, and we can model this. This is really catalysis for Paul Beta. It binds the DNTP, the fingers close. We have some non-covalent step. We know it's there by modeling and by checking our models very carefully. And we see it here. We see it with NMR as well. Uh, it's a, it's a non-covalent step. We have no idea what it does. And then we have chemistry. So we can look at these precatalytic conformational changes through fluorescence or forced to resonance energy transfer. And then we can look at the chemical transition state with the toolkit. And I've shown you now for K289M with our toolkit, this is not really rate limiting. Back here is where the rate limiting step of the reaction is. And so these are just the traces for wild type and for the mutant. If you get used to doing these experiments, uh, like Khadija, this is Khadija al Najar's work. If you do these experiments often enough, you see that this is greatly different than this. But it's hard to see when you, when you haven't done a lot of these experiments. But then we model them, and then we check them statistically. So now I'm going to show you. This is just, these are just the, the chemical pathways, the kinetic pathways. So we have the enzyme binding of the DNTP, and then we have the fingers closing step. 
that's very quick, 173 per second. The non-covalent stuff, which we really don't know what's happening here, is 24 per second. And then phosphodiester bond formation chemistry is 16 per second. We have no idea what this post-chemistry step is, but we think it has to do with fingers reopening. This is for that control sequence. And so you can see for K289M, first of all, that the fingers close a little more slowly, but the chemistry is rate limiting, it's rate determining, just as it is for wild type with the control sequence. Now let's look at the APC sequence. So we still see that fingers closing is slow, but now we see that this non-covalent stuff, we have no idea what it is, has become rate determining and chemistry is no longer rate determining. So this polymerase is perturbed at this non-covalent step leading to mutations within the APC gene. If we put that control sequence within the APC uh, larger sequence, we again see that chemistry is rate determining. So the polymerase is only really dealing with these six base pairs. It's only really seeing those six base pairs when it talks about sequence contact specificity. But then, if we take the APC sequence and plop it into the control sequence, again, this non-covalent step is rate determining. And so our conclusions are that, that K289M is a sequence context dependent mutator polymerase and that the non-covalent step is actually becoming rate determining for K289M in the presence only of the APC sequence and that the nature of the substrate and of the polymerase are critically important for the fidelity of DNA synthesis. And we think that the non-covalent step is important for substrate selection by Paul Beta. Now we've got to figure out what it is. So what do we think it is? So what we think is that we know that the DNTP binds uh, right here. This is, this is uh, arginine 183. We have, a, it depends, it, arginine 183 is critical for interaction with this DNTP. These are the magnesiums. 183 interacts with 182, which it also interacts with 316 and propagates its effects over to 324. And here's K289 sitting on the tip of helix N. We think this whole thing, there's some evidence that this, this whole structure, the subdomain, the stability of the sub, subdomain is absolutely critical for the positioning of helix N. And the positioning of helix N is critical for positioning this DNTP absolutely correctly within the active site so that there's not a misincorporation. So this is what we think is going on. It's about as good as it gets right now, but we're going to continue to try and figure out precisely what this non-covalent step is. We, we think it's actually minor adjustments of, K2, of, of, of helix N. What we actually think is going on is that helix N is somehow talking to these, this ARG 183 and 182, and we're working on that now. And so with that, uh, Khadija did uh, most of this work. This is the part of the team that, that did uh, the, the, kin the kinetic studies in the lab. Here are all of our collaborators. We have uh, wonderful funding that we're grateful for from the National Cancer Institute, and we know that Paul Bate is the best. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs>